welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. I'm Patrick Cristiano, your host, the publisher of TheaterLife.com, a website for theater buffs covering all things theater. And we have a very special guest today, someone that I just met recently, about maybe a year ago, and we've had limited communication, Kate Edelman Johnson. Uh, Kate, uh, thank you so much for coming. It's a oh, pleasure. Thank I'm you so for excited to have you. Kate, Kate is uh, the daughter of the film producer uh, Louis Edelman and the wife of uh, Dean Johnson, who was, was president of Time Warner. President of Time Warner and a major producer. Major lawyer in Hollywood. A major lawyer in Hollywood that dealt everybody. with everybody. Everybody. From yesterday, she, she's so like Holden, Audrey Hepburn, everybody. <laughs> Kate is a movie royalty, I, I think, in a way. You referred to yourself as a, how did you say it? Hollywood brat. <laughs> <laughs> I never think of you. But unlike a lot of them, I loved it. I was so cherished and so honored to be uh, the daughter of my dad, who was a very brilliant man. And my mother was like Auntie Mame. So the house was always filled with everybody he was working with. I mean, he went to a job every day, like everybody, but his job was producing films. Well, you want to talk about your father and how he started and his beginnings and uh, how he put himself through college? It was a wonderful, uh, wonderful story. He was in Harvard on a scholarship at 15. Wow. And he ran away from school when he was 17 and joined the Navy. It was World War I. And they caught him because he was underage, and they sent him to Annapolis, where he then became a lieutenant, J.G. They sent him to the North Atlantic at 18. He saved his entire ship and got the Navy Cross. Doing what? How did he do that? He was a great swimmer. He swam for the Harvard swim team. He said he did great until he had to swim against the Hawaiian swim team. <laughs> But um, however he did it, he wrote a movie based on it, PT-109. And uh, he went back to Harvard, finished, and his roommate was a man by the name of Eugene Zucker, son of Adolf Zucker. Wow. Who was, uh, after this happened, was the founder of Paramount Pictures. And Mr. Zucker gave his son and my dad jobs during the holidays and time off. And they built sets and painted scenery and did whatever they did. And so when my father graduated, he went to Mr. Zucker and said, I, I really love this industry, this new industry. Mm -hmm. Can I have a job? Well, by then the Lowe's family, theater family, had married the Zucker family. And so they gave my father a job selling film or showing the films, and they gave him the territory of the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains. And they would, so he would have to go work? on mule back with these cans of film. And then, then sell them to the people? I mean, they, he had to pitch them? They didn't have, they weren't going to just well, get they, them? He, the main office knew where the films were going to be shown, but this was rural America, and he would go what on year, mule year, back. You have an idea what year it was? You have an idea of the year? Probably 1925. Wow. And, you know, so these were silent mm -hmm. films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they would run the films in the, f in the funeral homes because they had the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and he finally got very, you know, he said, I've had enough of this. The, the McCoys and the Hatfields were still fighting across the street. <laughs> and he used to lie on the floor and he would pack sardines and saltines <laughs> so he could get out. And so they finally transferred him to Washington, Virginia, Maryland, and the White House. And I never knew why our house was filled with people like Paul Whiteman, Fred Waring, because he would hire them to play behind the movies. And he, in 1929, and I have the Variety article, he had saved up enough money, which is strange in 1929, to go to Hollywood. And he got a job managing Lowe's theaters, the Pantages, which is quite a famous theater, and another- Not how old was he then? He was uh, 29, 28. Yeah, okay, but almost 30. And so he, you know, he was managing these two major theaters, and one night a man came in and said, I'm having trouble with a film. 
I want to sit with the manager and see what he thinks because he sees so many audience right. reactions. So they called my dad. He didn't know who it was. Sat with the man. He said, "What was? What did you think?" He said, "Well, I think it worked up to here and it fell apart." He said, "Well, what would you do?" Kind of looking at him strangely, and he said, "Well, I would try." And he went whatever he said. I never asked enough right, questions. Right. And the man said, is this what you want to do, manage theaters? And my dad said, no, I want to produce. He took a card out of his pocket and said, be at my office tomorrow at 10 o'clock. It was Irving Thalberg. Wow. And yes. that was the beginning. So much about the people I interview and talk to, I find so many th serendipitous things that were just meant to be, like there's a destiny to the unfolding of people's lives in a way, if you just sit back and relax into it. I think so. I mean, what are the odds of that yeah, kind exactly of thing happening? Point. Right, right. And he took him on. He, Thalberg was his mentor. Thalberg was supposed to be best man at my mother and father's wedding. They were both New Yorkers. So my mother was coming from the East Coast, or they were going to have a big wedding. And at that point, Louis B. Mayer said, no, I'll give you a Labor Day weekend off. <laughs> so it's ironic that we should be doing it this weekend. And Thalberg by then had had his first heart attack, and so he could not be best man. So Louis B. Mayer was best man at my mother and father's wedding, and there were like 18 people, because they would, he wouldn't give them the time off to go back to New York mm -hmm. where they had planned mm -hmm. this whole thing. And uh, the house was always filled with music, because my father was a great piano player. He had never taken a lesson. And his best friends were songwriters like Jerome Kern. How, how many movies do you think your father produced? 85. 85. And I just want to, I have a list here, that's why I'm dig, digging on the floor of some of the people that went through your house. Gary Cooper, William Holden, James Stewart, Bing Crosby, Shirley Temple, Dinah Shore, William Paley, Norman Lear, <laughs> just to name a few. You can Some of those more. were my husband's friends and clients. He was their lawyer, like Norman Lear. Um, Norman Lear has come to see Top of the World six times. He's so in love with well, this let's show. Tell, you know, that people, are get, uh, our audience doesn't know that you are Ricky Kane Larimer's producer on Top of the World, okay. which was originally Cagney at the West Side uh, Theater before it was at the York, and it's a show that you're bringing to London and will circle back oh, we're, to we're very Broadway. Uh, and to me, it's, it's just, it's my heart, because my father did at least 12, if not 14, of Cagney's films and wrote some of them and produced some of them and just was non-credited on some of them because Jack Warner or his uh, main person took the credit. And he just wouldn't give double credit. He would never give double credit. So for instance, Even when they deserved it. On White Heat, he, uh, my father saw an oil a newsreel with an oil tanker blowing up and he worked backwards and he wrote the outline and Warner would not let him write the script. He hired someone to write the script, but my dad produced it. And they, they had this wonderful relationship. Cagney sat with my dad while I was being born, as the story goes, <laughs> and um, wow. then went out and adopted two children. So, and this, this, uh, this white heat moment, on top, that, that's uh, featured in your, uh, in Top of the World too, isn't it? Yes. It is. So, so we have a clip from it, well, that Warner Brothers was so gracious because you kind of well, got I've, them. I've worked with Warner Brothers a lot, and Julie Heath, who's the head of clips and licensing, said she would do this for us. So I'm delighted to hear that you got it. Well, I'm so thankful. I haven't yet seen it. So John, let's uh, see the clip from White Heat. Good memory for names. Too good. What do you like that, boys? A cop and I was going to split 50 50 
with a copper. <laughs> now tell me you're glad to see me. Only say hello. All I wanted was for you to come back. That's the truth. I love you, Cody. I love you. Shower curtain. It was Big Ed. He told me to do it. You wouldn't kill me in cold blood, would you? Now let you warm up a little. Let him have it. Oh, no. And lose our ace in the hole? He's gonna walk us out of here. Ain't you, copper? Ed. Still got nerves. <laughs> My father's favorite movie star, so I have seen every Cagney movie, too, growing up. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Well, my dad did some good ones. I understand there was a historian on the Warner lot that told me that he was actually part of the crew on Yankee Doodle Dandy. Mm -hmm. But again, no credit. But, you know, many other ones, uh, Public Enemy. He, my father created the term G-Men because government men, he thought, was too big for a marquee, for a theater marquee. Oh, how clever. And it's stuck. <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's a long time ago, too, right? It was a very long time ago. Now, now this, this conflict, because here we have Cagney playing a gangster, you know, which is the opposite, which we really wanted to do, and which was in his bones. He was a song and dance man, and that's what he really wanted to do. Absolutely. So your, your musical, your, your uh, Top of the World, kind of uh, delves into that conflict. It uh, does in, delve in, into the conflict, and it also uh, shows Warner to be what he really was. Uh, Barbara Warner, his daughter, came to see the show in New York, and I understand Bobby Creighton said, I'm just so sorry, I hope we didn't do your father an injustice. She said, you didn't make him mean enough. <laughs> And he would open everybody's mail. When my father's father died, he came on the set and said, Lou, I'm so sorry your father just died. Had the telegram open. <laughs> no. Nobody's mail was private. Nothing. He would say, whose name's on the water tank? Because there's a big water tank on top of the studio. What, what, Brothers. How old was he when he died? Do you know? Warner? Warner? I think he was in his late 70s or early 80s. Do you know what he died of? Meanness. I, 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 was trying, I was trying to get at it. I was trying to see what mean people go from. Go from. <laughs> he lived a long time. He did, you know, and he was very talented also. He knew what was good. I mean, think but of the number there, of right? movies that came out of that studio. But my dad started with Cagney on a, a movie, I think, called Varsity Show mm -hmm. that was really early on. And I remember it. The last one he did was the West Point story with Doris Day and Gordon McRae. Oh, that's a beautiful Lots of good movie. dancing in that one. That is really... Oh, excuse me, that wasn't the last one because he did Seven Little Foys, which is one of the most famous dance numbers ever. Because one of the... Briny Foy was one of his best friends, so they developed it together. But um, he ended up in television because he did two films with Danny Thomas. Uh, I'll See You in My Dreams, which was the story of the man that wrote that song, Gus Kahn. Mm -hmm. And then he did the remake of The Jazz Singer. And I asked a Hollywood historian why they remade The Jazz Singer. And he said because the Warner Brothers decided they should get in touch with their Jewishness. <laughs> and so he, they wanted Doris Day to work again with Danny. Uh -huh. And she said, no, I think it's too soon. So Peggy Lee did it and wrote some of the music. Oh, wow. Peggy Lee, who's celebrating her 100th birthday this year. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. 
So, so you, you've just grown up with stars coming through your house all the time? But see, that was my normal. I didn't know they were stars. I didn't know that you didn't walk into your but, house. But when, when, but when you got out into the real world and you met real people, could you tell the difference between the energy of a star and the energy of an ordinary person? Well, I mean, there are an awful lot of ordinary people that have great energy. Okay. So, and I tend to be around people that are in the same industry. It's different today. And you today. probably attract that kind of wonderful energy anyway. It, it, you know, I think it was more creative then. They were, they were doing real stories about real people. And today there's a lot of comic books and... Fantasy stuff, I'll just call it, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, to walk into my house and see Barbara Stanwyck sitting on the floor feeding my dog out of her coffee cup. And tell us the story normal. about Barbara Stanwyck teaching you to curse. Oh, my God. She was incredible. Everybody called her Missy, who knew her. And my father did a show called the Barbara Stanwyck Theater. It won all the Emmy Awards that year. And NBC, in its infinite wisdom, canceled it. So my father said to her, I will find something for you to do that won't be taken off the air. And he created the Big Valley. He wrote it and created it. And then he left you the rights to it. He left me the rights to it. They reverted. They are now at Disney. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that they're coming back to us very soon. But Barbara Stanwyck, I think, is one of the finest film actresses of all time. Oh, I mean, agree. she's. I mean, people don't realize how f every, she makes every moment so real and funny. Uh, she's just got so many funny. colors. I can't believe how fast the time goes. But we have about ten minutes, and I don't remember how long these clips are. But one of the things that you were also uh, left with the rights to streetcar named Desire, which you're father co-produced. No, my, my husband. Your husband, I'm sorry. Your husband co-produced. Co -produced. Uh, it was Charlie Feldman. Yes. And he left me his share and he had Charlie Feldman leave his share to the Motion Picture and Television Fund. And mine is being left to the Actors Fund. Which so you're very involved in. I'm very, very involved in it, yes. And all of your... It's now the Entertainment Community Fund. They've changed the name and for the life of me, I can't remember to say it. I, I, yeah, I know. It's the Actors Fund was so much but better. But everybody right? kept saying, well, it's only for actors. Why should we donate? So and anyway, the film has been left to two incredibly wonderful organizations. And I, I, do, I have, we have a, we have the original trailer for oh, Streetcar yeah. Named Desire. And then we have a scene. So I don't know how long they are. We have nine minutes. So let's show them, because I, 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 I was anxious to get them to, to show them to the audience, especially the original trailer. I'm anxious to see them. So here we go. John, let's have the original trailer from Streetcar Named Desire. What year is it? 19, I don't know, 30? No. No. 40. 1950. 50, 50, 50, 50 something. On the Pulitzer Prize, the Critics Award, the most revealing play ever written. New York, London, Paris, Brussels, Rome, all cheered it. It's an even greater motion picture. This is the star woman, Blanche Dubois, who wanted so much to stay a lady. A vivid, vibrant, exciting story, because every searching chapter was written by men. Men who taught her to trust and to hope, to love and to hate. The youth who brought remembrance of yesterday. The man who was willing to take her out of the dark alleys of New Orleans. The brute who lied and cheated, who promised everything, gave nothing. Don't you ever talk that way to me. Disgusting, balder, greasy. But who do you think you are, a couple of queens or something? Could it be you and me, Blanche? 
Yeah, what does it cost for single furs like that? Why, why, these are a tribute from an admirer of mine. Well, he must have had a lot of admiration. You lies! Lies inside and out! All lies! Never inside! I never lied in my heart! Plenty of room to get by me now. Oh. You think I'm going to interfere with you? Marry me, Mitch. I don't think I want to marry you anymore. No, you're not clean enough to bring in a house with money. Go away, then. Thank you, Warner Brothers. Yeah. I have never seen that, so it's really I have a never pleasure seen that, uh, a treat to get to see it. Thank trailer. you. <laughs> well, it's a wonderful movie. Oh, film. it's fabulous. I love the play. I love Tennessee Williams. This was an incredible movie. All the performances were excellent. There's two, uh, the Actors Fund and the Motion Picture and Television Fund, uh, I've arranged to do a screening and have people talk about it and so forth on the Warner lot in the spring so that people know that this can be done, where you can leave a piece of property to one of those two great organizations. So they've been very helpful on all of that. Oh, that's really good to do, too. Yeah. You get other people to do the same thing, right? I hope so. <laughs> yeah. So we, I, I, what, should we show them the other clip, too? Why not? <clears throat> we have the the, the, the one that probably did more for T-shirts than any other. <laughs> <laughs> the, the very famous Marlon Brando Stella scene. So, John, we could have that, too. <clears throat>
fabulous. <laughs> it is. It's, <laughs> it's one of the best, one, one of the finest movies of all time. I think you know, so. Yeah, one of the top ten for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I am so lucky to have been associated with the two men that were the most important in my life, with the talent and the kindness. You know, that's the important thing. But to get to play on the studio back lots too, and to I go into to those as a kid, and then I started working for my father when I was twelve, answering Hugh O'Brien's fan mail on Wyatt Earp. And um, I, could I mean, did you actually write the letters yourself? I did. I said, he, I he did. didn't. There were postcards. But he didn't consult you. You just wrote whatever you wanted. Uh, I, you know what? I just mostly signed them, I think, okay. if I remember correctly. <laughs> and I think I got the amazing amount of $25 a week. There was no nepotism in my family. <laughs> when it came to paychecks, anyway. <laughs> I got, well, yeah, but, you know, I can't say it was a lot. But, uh, and then I started doing synopses for Danny Thomas on that show, because that was the first show Danny and my dad created together. So, yeah, did you get to meet Marlo too? Uh, I know Marlo and Terry, and I am a huge supporter of St. Jude. That's a fabulous they organization. Oh, I mean, actually, God, it was just my birthday, and I posted on Facebook I would like $500 for St. Jude, and I got $1,250. Oh. <laughs> so I'm very proud of that. <laughs> but, the, the children of St. Jude's break our hearts. Danny had done the two movies with my father, and he said, my kids call me Uncle Daddy find me something to do so I can stay at home. So on the proverbial napkin, my father wrote out the idea for Make Room for Daddy. And he said, here. And Danny said, what do you mean here? You're coming with me. And he said, no, I don't do hurry up motion pictures. And obviously he convinced him and they started with Make Room for Daddy, Andy Griffith, Dick Van Dyke, Real McCoys, Wyatt Earp, Californians, Jim Bowie, Big Valley. So it was, quite, it was quite a relationship, and he was a most wonderful man. And his legacy is something that will go on forever. So. This was just too brief a treat. <laughs> <laughs> we, there's so much more we could delve into, and we're out of time. I'm so sorry, but I love talking about these. And I love listening people. to it. I could have sat here for another half hour easily. Someday. So thank you so much. Maybe we'll get to hang out some more. <laughs> I would love it. Next time I'm on the East Coast. <laughs> Let's keep you here a little longer. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you. It's my pleasure.